anyway, what the Bible teaches about Israel in the last days. So on October 7th, as we all know, Israel was attacked um, by Hamas coming out of Gaza. Gaza is a strip of land inside of Israel that was turned over to um, Hamas to govern and to take care of. And this is the group that reached out across the border and committed those atrocities. I don't want to outline them. I think we've all heard enough of what's gone on. It's as bad as you can imagine. And so our hearts are broken. Our hearts go out to those families and to uh, the nation of Israel. And I have a lot of friends over there. And um, they, they are feeling this deeply, um, as you can imagine. Um, but what's important for us to know is to make a distinction that Hamas is a religious group. And if you read, and I'm not, I'm, this is not Troy Warner's commentary. I encourage you to go do this. <clears throat> go out there and look up an English translation of the Hamas's charter and read it for yourself. And um, I'm going to tell you what it says, but you go read it for yourself. They make it very clear. This is about religion for them. This is not about government. This is not about that. It's about their religious beliefs. <clears throat> And in particular, if you read Article 13 of their charter, what you're going to find out is they have no intention to negotiate. They see it as a waste of time to go to any conferences, sit down for any peace talks or negotiations. And their ultimate goal is to eradicate the land of Israel and the world of Jews. So this is what that group is doing. Now, they're governing over um, uh, you know, the land of Gaza, where there are many Palestinians and um, some of them support them. Some of them um, are caught in the crossfire of it all. Um, but it is, it's, it's one thing when people come and commit terrorist acts and, um, and do what they do. And then when you and, and target civilians versus a nation that God has given obligations to, to protect their people. Read it. The one of the things that God has established governments, and one of the things very one of the things that government does is to protect their people. So as they are protecting them and trying to get into a situation, means they will just go negotiate with them. They've said in their charter they don't want to negotiate and they think it's a waste of time. So you can see the difficulty and the complexity of this issue. So just to understand that from their own words, where they are coming from. But how do we as Christians understand Israel, the days we live in, and are these the last days? So let me take the last one first, because it's easiest. Yes, you're living in the last days. The Bible says so. First John says that this is the last hour, that we are living in those final moments. So we are living in the last days. <clears throat> Is Jesus about to return at any second? Well, he can return at any moment. Is he about to return? The Bible tells me something about trying to figure that out. What is it? Don't do it. Don't do it. And so if you've been burnt by pastors or ministries that said, hey, the Lord's about to return. It's going to happen at this particular time. Well, I'm sorry they did that. And Shame on you for not reading your Bible and knowing that you're not supposed to believe that. We don't know when it's going to happen. So this is not about, hey, the Lord is coming back at this second. We should live every day as if it's the day the Lord returns, because none of us know what day the Lord is going to return. I want to break this down into three sections. And it's God's past work in Israel, God's present work in Israel, and God's future work in Israel. So as we consider God's past work in Israel, <clears throat> let's go back to Genesis 12, 1 through 3. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house. He was living in Ur of the Chaldees. To a land that I will show you, that is the land of Israel. <clears throat> I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So he gives two main promises. I'm going to make you a great nation. And that indeed happened. And secondly is, you're, <coughs> you're, you're going to be a, a blessing to all the families of the earth. 
And that also has happened because Jesus is from the family of Abraham. He's a descendant of Abraham, and he has provided his salvation. So the nations of the world look to this, this one that has come from Abraham and as Savior of the world. From the moment that the Lord announced that he was going to make them a great nation, and specifically that the families of the earth would be blessed, that is, the Messiah would come through his physical descendants to reverse the curse that began in the garden, um, Satan has been trying to wipe out the people of Israel. And you see this down in Egypt when they were growing and prospering, how the pharaohs wanted to eradicate large numbers of them. You see it, ladies, you're studying Esther and your uh, women's study. You see it in Haman's plot to um, eradicate all the Jews and to kill all of them throughout the empire. But God had other plans. And just like he had raised up Moses, he raised up a young teenage girl named Esther to speak on behalf of the people. And she finds favor for the king and the people are spared. We see this same kind of hatred that um, uh, towards the Jews that existed in King Herod when he found out that the king of the Jews had been born in Bethlehem, Jesus. And he seeks to kill all two-year-olds um, you know, in that region. They flee to Egypt, they end up coming back, and then they end up putting Jesus to death. But that, on Satan's part, was to stop the work of salvation. But on God's part, he used it to bring salvation and he raised him from the dead three days later. Since Jesus' ascension, Satan has continued to attack the Jewish people. Why? Why? What's the, why is he so set on attacking these people? Well, because God has put his favor upon them. But if the Messiah has already come, why doesn't he just leave them alone? I mean, you, you, he's not going to come through them again. And the answer is, yes, he's not going to come through them again, but he is going to what? Come again for them. And so just like in the first coming, he wanted to stop him. And yes, what your Old Testament is pretty much about. In the second coming, if their Israel's eradicated, then he can't come save them. And if he doesn't come to save them, then he's not going to set up a kingdom, which means he continues to rule and reign over this world. So I would say that the, uh, it's Israel has a hatred set upon them from Satan because of God's plans to bless them. And he uses governments and individuals and people to carry out that hostility and those hatreds. You know, Israel's been blamed for so many things. Jews have been blamed for so many things down through the ages. They were blamed for the Black Plague. They've been blamed for all kinds of things. They were blamed for the problems in Germany. And, you know, the final solution, let's kill all of the Jews and the Holocaust that took place. This is something that has happened in so many different ways, and I'm only mentioning a few of them. So God has worked in the past through Israel, and God is working in Israel today. <clears throat> now, when I say that, what do I mean? Am I... Now, listen, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Hear the whole thing, all right? Israel is not a perfect nation, nor have they ever been. Read your Bible. Nor is any country perfect, nor is any individual perfect. I believe they were innocent in what happened. But in what I'm about to say, I do not think we should look at Israel and think that everything they do and everything they say all the time is right. Because Israel is a secular government that does not believe in the Lord, and they certainly do not believe in Jesus as Messiah. That's a problem. They need to turn to the Lord. And your brothers and sisters that are Christians, followers of Jesus, over in Israel would ask you to pray for their salvation and pray for the right and righteous thing. They're grieved like you're grieved about your country that does unrighteous things and has unrighteous laws. So I think it's important that we understand they're not some perfect, sinless group of people. And I say that only because there are some ministries that do teach that. As a matter of fact, they would even teach that God has so blessed Israel, they don't even need to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. It's like, what kind of nonsense? What did you eat that made you say such a dumb, unbiblical thing like that? No, they need to be saved. Just like... I needed to be saved. But what is God doing among Israel? Well, Ezekiel declared that in the latter days, 
that Israel would be gathered back into the land and they would be brought out of a, um, from the sword. I'm going to suggest to you that that event <coughs> happened in 1948 when they became a nation again. And in 70 AD, they were driven out from the land. They returned to the land. I don't mean every Jew was gone, but in, in the national status, national um, position, they were gone from 70 AD until 1948, where they came back and had uh, nation status. But read what the Bible has to say. In Ezekiel 38.8, it says, After many days, that's a long time, right? You, you know, 70 AD to 1948. After many days you will be visited. When? In the latter years, the last days. And you will come into the land <coughs> of those brought back from the sword, and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. So I believe that while there are no prophecies that need to be fulfilled for Jesus to return, there are certain prophecies that have been fulfilled, and I would make a very, very short list of them, but this is one of them. This is a fulfilled prophecy, okay, that they would come back into the land after being out of the land for many days. And the land that they received is a land that is an everlasting possession. Genesis 17, 8 says, Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. How long is the possession of that land for? Everlasting. And how long is your salvation? Everlasting. It's interesting how we are willing to step back and look at Israel and say, oh, this everlasting promise given to you for land, is it not, actually, it's not for everlasting. It's only until Jesus died and rose from the dead, and then it stopped. Which is very interesting, because if you were a Jew, you would have very mixed emotions about being excited about the Messiah, wouldn't you? Just think about that. But, but this, the, the promise here is that it's everlasting. But there are those that say, no, it's not. But, so does Israel have a right to be in this land? And the answer is yes. Do they have a right to ever oppress or, or treat the foreigner or the stranger with some kind of trouble? Uh, you know, not considering that? No, they don't have a right for that. No, no country, no people has a right to harm and abuse. But it is theirs and God gave it to them. Now, you might want to read Deuteronomy 31 through 10. It's an Old Testament passage that talks about how even if Israel sins and they're driven from the land, that if they repent, that God will bring them back. And they have been brought back into the land, and I would argue, awaiting the repentance. But they are there in the land, and they need to see that Jesus is their Lord and their Messiah. So this is what God is doing with them today. I don't think you should see that as an insignificant thing. It's incredibly significant. I mean, if you were living in 125 AD or 1500 AD or 1700 AD or 1800 AD or 1900 AD or 1925, you could not say that Israel was back in their land. It's since 1948 that they've been back in the land. And this putting us in those latter days when God said he'd bring them back in. It is absolutely necessary for Israel to be in their land for the prophecies of the book of Revelation and Daniel and many others to be fulfilled. <laughs> so God has a future work. So God's past work, God's present work, but God has a future work. And this is where a lot of Christians disagree. So uh, not trying to hide my position. I am pre-trib. I am pre-mill. I believe that Jesus will come from the church before the great tribulation starts. I'm pre-mill. I believe that the Lord will set up a thousand-year reign of Christ upon this earth. <clears throat> but not everybody holds that position, obviously. Um, some will say no. Um, I, I actually don't believe that modern Israel is a group of people that God is still working with because the church has replaced Israel. So all the promises that you would read for Israel it should now be allegorized that have not been fulfilled in the first coming. All of the promises should now be allegorized and they should apply to the church. And so, you know, the church is the thing that the Lord established. <clears throat> and so people will look at this. Others see... Um, them awaiting salvation and the fulfillment of the promises, and that is our position. 
So why, how can you have such a difference of opinion among Bible-believing Christians? So we're not talking about like liberal Christians and, you know, no, we're talking about Bible-believing. I trust in Jesus for salvation. I rejoice in his work on the cross and his resurrection. And I believe that he is coming back again types of Christians. How can we have such a, dis- a difference of opinion? And it comes down to this one point, and I'm going to spend a bit of time here. How do you interpret Old Testament, New Testament prophecy that has not been fulfilled? And it's that, that has not been fulfilled. Because all the prophecies that have been fulfilled, we agree together that these are fulfilled literally. And I'll demonstrate that for you in just a moment. But the difference exists with prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled concerning Israel, both in the Old Testament and New Testament. So I would say, expect it to be literally fulfilled for them. Others, uh, amillennialists, postmillennialists, would say, no, no, no. These are things that are allegorical and are spiritually fulfilled by the church. But I want to ask you, and this is hard, I think, for us. Even if you're in the... Like the same camp as I am, why do you believe what you believe? And if you're not in the camp that I'm in, I want to ask you, why do you hold the, uh, the end times views that you have? And the answer, I, I think sadly, is, well, this is the church I was raised in. This is what I heard. This is what I taught. And I, you know, I've been taught, okay, that, that's good to a certain point, but I don't want any of you to have that position. I want you to come to the conclusion because you've read your Bible and you have studied the scriptures and rightly divided it. That's where we all need to come on all of these issues. Now, listen, I'm not apologizing for my views. I actually think they're right. That's why I hold them. As a matter of fact, I would even say to those of you that say, well, I don't believe in a preacher rapture. And I, I just like, that's fine. On the way up, I'm going to explain it to you. <laughs> and you're going to never have been so happy to have been so wrong. You're like, yeah, funny, Troy. But what happens if you don't go? Then I'm coming to your house for beans and rice because I don't store any of those up because I think I'm going to be out of here. So if you know you're going through the tribulation, I assume you're storing up a lot of supplies. So keep up the good work. Um, <laughs> We're all coming over to your house. You'll be out of supplies by the end of the weekend. So uh, I don't know what you do for the next six years. But that's, I don't want to argue over this. I just, I know we hold different opinions. And I I don't apologize. I believe I have very biblical reasons for them, as I'm sure you do too. But it comes down to this one issue. How do you interpret Old Testament prophecy? How do you interpret New Testament prophecies that have not been fulfilled? Do you accept them and take them literally or allegorically? That is, the, that is the issue. And you've got to figure that one out. You've got to come to a conclusion on this. So, um, you know, premillennialist, yeah, we believe that, you know, Revelation 20 verses 5 through 8, Jesus is going to come back, rescue Israel from the nations <coughs> that have gathered to destroy her and set up a thousand year reign. All millennialists, They do not see a literal reign of Christ and believe that God has replaced Israel with the church. The church is spiritual Israel. So all of the prophecies are allegorized. uh, Postmillennial sees the reign of Jesus happening right now through the church. I'm disappointed. I was expecting a little bit more than this. You know what I'm saying? So they say, no, this is going to happen. It's going to get better and better and better. And then it's going to get to this, you know, golden age. And then when we reach that point, then Jesus will come back and he will rule and reign over this wonderful kingdom that has been established um, by the work of Jesus through the church, they would say. But both all mill and post mill deny a literal reign of Christ and Israel receiving a literal kingdom and having an everlasting promise of the land. They see those as allegorical. So it comes down to our method. So um, one reason, not the only reason for our belief that Jesus will rule and reign, and that Israel, is God is not finished. <coughs> one reason, there are many, but one is, <coughs> let me grab a drink here. So one reason for believing this is our commitment to a consistent method of interpreting Scripture. So everybody believes in interpreting Scripture literally until 
I'm talking about Bible-believing evangelicals, until it comes to prophecy. And so they would have a literal method on matters of doctrine, matters of history, uh, matters of uh, first coming prophecies. But when it comes to second coming prophecies, they drop the consistent literal method where I say I'm all in all the time. Oh, you don't believe in metaphors? No, I believe in metaphors. And I believe in hyperbole and similes and all the rest to describe literal truth. As a matter of fact, if you want to emphasize a literal truth, a lot of times we will use hyperbole to really capture people's attention so they will focus not on the hyperbole, but on the truth that we're trying to talk about. So all of those things are just um, tools of language to bring us to the literal truth. So this is, I have an unflinching approach to a consistent literal approach to Scripture. Now, when you do that, you come to one conclusion, and only one conclusion, and that is God is not finished with Israel. Israel is going to be persecuted at the end of the days in the Great Tribulation, and Jesus will come back and rescue and set up a thousand-year reign, if you interpret it literally. Now, if you don't, well, you can, at that point, sky's the limit. Make it out to be whatever you want to be. But it's not just me who holds this position that says that's what happens when you interpret it literally. Here's a quote from a man by the name Floyd Hamilton. And he's an all-millennialist. And this is what he says. You have it up there. A literal interpretation of Old Testament prophecies gives us such a picture of an earthly reign of the Messiah as the premillennialist pictures or the literal interpreter of Scripture on second coming prophecies. So he realizes that if you take it literally, you end up in a different camp. That's why I said how you interpret Scripture, you're going to end up in one of two camps, and then there's sub-camps but, um, of each of these. But it's a literal approach. So, for example, <coughs> all millennialists, post-millennial, pre-millennialists, we all celebrate um, fulfilled prophecy of the first coming. They get excited like you get excited when we find out that Jesus was born to a virgin, just like Isaiah the prophet said. That he was pierced through at his crucifixion. They will look at that and they'll say, look at this fulfilled prophecy. The casting of lots for clothes, betrayed by a friend, riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, born in Bethlehem. They all believe those things were literally fulfilled. They don't allegorize it. It was a literal fulfillment. Second coming prophecies, they do not do that. They change their method and they have a different way in which they approach that. Let me give you an example. And here's a question I want to ask you. Not theology, but from the Bible, because that's what we're interpreting. We're not interpreting theology, okay? We're interpreting the Bible. So in the Bible, where is the the indication, where is the statement to stop interpreting things literally and begin to interpret them allegorically? It's not there. It's got to be inferred from some passages. Um, And yet, I want to show you that in a single passage, in one verse, hip, hip, hooray, literal prophecy fulfilled. Next verse, talking about the second coming, oh, don't take that literally, that's allegorical which to me is incredibly problematic that from one verse to the next without any indication that you should change the way you interpret that it happens. So let me pick one you're very, very familiar with. I could choose from dozens of them, but I think this is the one that's the easiest to see. And I'm only going to give you a couple of verses. You go back and read all the context. But Zechariah 9, 9, and 10. I'm going to read verse 9, and I'm going to ask literal or allegorical. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of the donkey. Is that literal or allegorical? Literal. It's Palm Sunday we're talking about here. Right? Nobody disputes that. Everybody agrees that that is a literal uh, prophecy that came to pass. Jesus even made certain it happened. He sent his friends to go get a donkey, uh, a colt that was tied, and bring it to him. And he rode into Jerusalem. <clears throat> Palm branches being laid down. You know, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Pharisees get upset, tell your disciples to be quiet. So that's literal. Verse 10, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim <coughs> and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He, the one that comes riding on the donkey, shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion, his reign, shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. That's not fulfilled. Jesus has not done that yet. But we would look at this and say, this is yet to happen. There will be a dominion that will be over all of the world, and, and Jesus will speak peace to the nations. And I would say that is going to happen at his second coming. <clears throat> but others would say, oh no, that's allegorical. That is being realized on some level, doesn't much matter to what degree, spiritually, the church has experienced this. I don't even know how they come up with uh, some of the application for this, but I can tell you that this is the issue. So you've got to decide when you look at Israel and you say, what should I think about it biblically? You have to decide, how am I going to interpret scripture? Am I going to be consistently, literally interpreting scripture, factoring in the metaphors and the similes and the symbolism and the hyperbole to find the literal truth? Or am I going to say second um, coming prophecies <coughs> should all be taken allegorically, or at least the ones that relate to Israel. So you can see why this is a problem um, and, and why there is a difference of opinion that takes place. But I want to say that God is not done with Israel. God is not done with Israel. If we take a literal approach to the word of God, you can't have any other conclusion. Even the opponents of my position would say, if you take it literally, you definitely will end up in that view of Israel and that view of end times. God swore to Israel that he would not abandon Israel. Do you take that allegorically or do you take that literally? So let me read to you <coughs> Jeremiah 31, verses 35 through 37. Here's a promise from the Lord to Israel that I will never cast you off. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for light by night, who disturbs the seas and, the waves, and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If... So circle that. If those ordinances depart from me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me. When will they stop to be a nation? When the sun doesn't rise, when the stars don't give their light, when the moon does not reflect the light of the sun, then Israel will no longer be a nation. Question, did the sun come up this morning? Yes, it did. And it will every day until... The Lord is finished with this world. And you read about that in Revelation. But so as long as these things are happening, God said, you can count on the fact that you will be a nation to me forever. Thus says the Lord. If heaven above can be measured, which interestingly enough, we can't. And the foundations of the earth searched out. We haven't gotten to the foundations of even our own planet. Beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all they have done, says the Lord. So he says, like, listen, if that happens, then I'll get rid of you because of what you've done. But those things can't happen. And even what you've done will not be reason for me to stop seeing you as a nation. I don't know how you can get any clearer than this. God says, I will never be finished with you. He's like, well, that's Old Testament. Okay, Romans 11, read it all. There's a lot in there. Romans eleven twenty five. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant. And that's the problem. There's a lack of knowledge around this mystery. <clears throat> What's the mystery? Well, unless you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Does that sound like that's a forever blindness or a part-time blindness? Well, you can only read that one way. If you understand the English language, you know it's only for a time. And so this is what Paul's saying about the, the nation of Israel. It's interesting to me that when you read prophecy, it's, we find words like know and understand, don't be ignorant, you know, study these things. 
Um, and yet there is so much lack of understanding. I bet that even some of you in here right now are saying, you know, you're talking about all these debatable things like end times. We just can't know them. We don't understand them. You shouldn't even spend time on it. Well, what, what did I just read here? Is that we should not be ignorant about that. As a matter of fact, Jesus is going to say, um, a quote from Daniel, that we should understand them. By the way, the name, what's the name of the last book of our Bible? Revelation. Sure, it's not confusion. <laughs> I, I, because I think this is the way some believers see it. So no, you, you read this, you, it's so confusing you can't understand. But the, what, the word, sometimes I think we even miss it. It's, oh, it's the book of Revelation. But what does the word mean? It means to reveal. What's it revealing? Jesus and the last days. So it's not meant to confuse. But if you don't take a literal approach, it's very confusing. So this is my opinion. I'm saying this with all love. You can, hopefully those of you that have a different opinion will be challenged. And I'm, I'm, I'm open to your questions. Probably not today because I'm just going to cough afterwards. But <laughs> hit me up later. There are many passages that speak of worldwide aggression <clears throat> against Israel in the last days. Jeremiah, Joel, Zechariah, Daniel, all talk about last days trouble and aggression from the nations. You know this. One of the last most famous battles of the world will be the battle of Armageddon. What is that? It's the nations of the world gathering together to destroy the nation of Israel. And Jesus talks about this. In Matthew 24, Jesus says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation <coughs> spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then those who are in Judea flee. All right, that's Israel. The holy place is the temple. That's where the Jews worshipped. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those <coughs> who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babes in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, another very Jewish day, for then there will be great tribulation, unlike anything you've ever seen. So, <clears throat> Jesus refers to the Great Tribulation as a future event, and that Israel would actually be in their land, they would have a temple, and that the Antichrist would commit the abomination of desolation, and then they would be attacked and they should flee. If Israel is no longer a group of people, then this, does not, this is not future. It's make it out to be whatever you want it to be. It's allegorical. And if Israel's not in the land. They can't flee from their land. They've got to be back in their land to be able to flee from Judea. They were, the long, mountains were long desolate, right? 70 AD to 1948. But now they're back, and they actually could flee. Now listen, we should not in any way rejoice over the trouble that Israel is going through. We're told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. This is why when John took the scroll of the book of Revelation, he was told to eat it, he said that it was sweet to his mouth, but it was what? Bitter in his stomach. Oh, it's sweet to talk about the return of the Lord, but it is a bitter thing to read about what's coming upon this earth. So the Bible is clear that God is not done with Israel. Jeremiah, Romans 11, don't be ignorant. Jesus himself said that Israel would be back in the land. Now listen, even more than this, God names the nations that will come against her. <coughs> Now, we don't know. I'm going to refer to Ezekiel 38 and 39. I think this is a pre-tribulation battle, but many would associate this with the Battle of Armageddon, and I can see why. And um, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a strong position on this, but but I, I I would land as something happening before. Either way, look at the nations that are going to come against Israel as prophesied by Ezekiel. So I already read the Ezekiel passage that they would come back into the land in the latter days. Well, he goes on to talk about what nations would want to destroy them once they come back into the land. Read it on your own, Ezekiel 38 and 39. But please put up that map, and you can see the nations that are named and all of them converging against Israel. Now, as you read Ezekiel, he's going to use the contemporary names of these places which don't always equate to our modern names. 
Um, so he's going to mention Rosh, which many would say Russia, others would say Turkey. Um, Turkey is certainly on the list of nations. Um, and you have Gomer, um, Meshach, Tubal, and Tagarma are all different parts of this large mass of land that we know as Turkey. Um, Ethiopia is mentioned, which is Sudan, <coughs> very anti-Israel. Libya, anti-Israel. And Persia, which is Iran. And of course, we know how they feel. They want to eradicate Israel. They're the ones that are funding Hamas and, and their Article 13 to destroy Israel and to take back their land. They're the ones that are funding Hezbollah. Now, they're not Israel, you know, Iran in those spots, but they're, but they're a part of this. And one day at the end, they will come. Look at all these. Now, you, you, here we see the anti-Semitism that exists in the world today. You know, I think there was a proper good response with so many nations and so many people coming out and, and just saying, hey, we feel your pain, Israel. We grieve with you. We're sorry this happened. I think that is a proper response anytime somebody goes through something like that. And yet hundreds of thousands of people thought this was a good time to say Israel should be finished. Israel should be over. They should be destroyed. They don't belong. They don't believe they should be a nation. And you're, part of this is like, Can you, you're saying that right now? But you can see the anti-Semitism that exists. Stars of David being painted on people's homes in Germany. Saying, here's the Jews if you want to go get them. And you're like, are you serious? You guys are doing that again? And yet, yes, again that has happened. There's those that don't even believe that the Jews went through the Holocaust. You know, it's like, really? But there's the nations that God says in the last days are going to stand against <coughs> Israel. All of these nations have had their names in the news this last weeks, standing against Israel. So listen, <clears throat> am I saying Jesus is coming back this week? No, I'm saying I want him to come back this week. I don't know when he's going to come back. Is this the events that are going to lead to the beginning of the Great Tribulation? I believe the rapture happens first, so I'm not going to even see the things we've talked about. So you know, this battle in question, if it happens before or after. But are we going to even see these things, you know, continue to escalate and it's going to be the end time? Well, that part we don't know, do we? Because this may be something that heats up and comes back down. Just like the 1973 war that Israel was in, or the 67 or the 48 war, the, you know, Sinai war. All these different, it could be another thing that rises and comes off. But one day... One day, and you don't know when, and I don't know when, it's not going to do that. It's going to rise up, and it's going to keep going, and it's going to be what leads into the fulfillment of the prophecies that are written in Scripture. So what do we do? Well, one last passage. It's in Romans chapter 13, and it's verse 11. <clears throat> and do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry, not in drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. When you know the times and you see that the Lord's return is getting near, we walk like he's about to show up. We live in such a way that we won't be ashamed at his appearing. Israel has been regathered. Israel will be attacked by the nations of the world, and God will deliver Israel. The church will be, will be raptured before any of these events happen. And so that tells you how near we are to... The, to um, Events and, and we don't know the day. So we live as if the Lord could come back at any moment. This is the teaching of the New Testament. Now again, I realize some of you have been, you thought it was coming on this date and this event. And listen, I, I'm pre-trib, I'm pre-mill. I think I, I've, I've made that pretty clear. But I'll tell you something. I have little patience for those who are pre-trib, pre-mill, who say nonsensical things. And there's, it, there, you know, there's so much of this is going on. You say, oh, this is a prophecy. This is a fulfillment. This is a prophecy. This is it. And then you look back over, you know, 
you know, a year or two years or five years and 10 years, it's like, that was not a fulfillment. That was just an interesting geopolitical thing that took place. <laughs> um, so I, I do not want to say, this is it. This is the final thing. Get ready. We're about to go. Practice jumping when you get home for the rapture. I'm not saying any of those things, okay? But I am saying he may come back. Now, you know what? Jesus could come back when we don't see anything going on over there. So you don't have to have these events for the rapture to happen. But when we see them, we should look. You know, you look back on all the whole COVID thing. And I'll tell you what my big takeaway was there. Look how quickly the world all jumped and fell into line with a single word of what should be done. You had nations you can never anticipate doing the same thing, doing the same thing. And this is the way it's going to be when the Antichrist returns. Not the COVID piece, but just the world falling in line behind one world leader. So we should be looking up for our redemption draws nigh. Why do we believe that what's happening over in Israel is significant? Because the Bible said the things we're seeing are the very things that would happen in the last days. He's coming back. And you're like, well, in my lifetime, I don't know. But as I like to say, look in the mirror. It's getting closer one way or the other. You're going to him or he's coming to you. We're all getting older and our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Worship team, you can stay where you are. I'm just going to close in prayer. And I'm going to ask um, all of us just to stand. Strong exhortation from Paul in Romans. How are you living? Do these things cause you to contemplate where your time, energy, and efforts are being spent? Because one day Jesus is going to come back. And we all are going to give an account for how we've lived. Jesus came the first time. The world was not ready. Didn't want anything to do with them. The same thing's going to happen again. But not for you. Because you're in the light. You're children of the day. And you know what's happening. So you're going to live for him. And you're going to preach the gospel. You're going to walk uprightly. You're not going to get caught up in the lusts of the world. Because we know better. And we've been redeemed for better. Let's pray. Father, thank you for <coughs> your word. Um, you say that you do nothing without first telling your servants, the prophets. You've told us. You've told us what's going to happen. The world will, you'd bring Israel back. The world would gather against her and you would set up your kingdom. Lord, we see the things that are happening. And we don't know the day nor the hour, but we all know this. We need to be living for you completely and totally. So help us, Lord, to live righteously and soberly in these present days. If you need to do business with the Lord, do business with the Lord right now. If you don't know Jesus, you need to come and let him forgive you of your sins. And we all should have a hope and anticipation of the soon return of the Lord. That's what the New Testament says. Check your spiritual temperature for the return of the Lord. I hope it's, I hope it's hot. I hope it's getting hotter. Lord, and we say, as your servant John, even so, Lord, come soon, come quickly, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.